It's February, and that means that stores everywhere are obsessed with selling us as many stuffed bears that we don't need, chocolates that were made with child slave labor, and greeting cards with unhealthy ideas about love on them as they possibly can. Dating is hard, but statistically speaking, if you're watching this video, you are the type of person who hopes to one day form some sort of long-term romantic relationship with someone, settle down, maybe get married, have a couple of kids, buy a white picket fence, the whole nine. According to Pew Research, 48% of 18 to 29 year olds say that they have used online dating services before, but honestly, I think this number is misleading. I think that number might refer specifically to dating sites like Tinder, Match.com, eHarmony, stuff like that. I met my wife online. And that wasn't actually a dating site. We just happened to be in the same Discord server and we hit it off. So I think if we account for situations like that, the number of people who meet a significant other online is probably actually a lot higher. The plus side of online dating is that it opens up the possible dating pool tremendously. All of a sudden, we have access to people that we may have never met before, either just to having different schedules, living in different parts of the world, whatever the case may be. The downside for us privacy folks is that we know very well that pretty much the entire internet was built on top of surveillance capitalism, which means that if we want to take advantage of this incredible opportunity, we basically have to be prepared to fork over a lot of data. So what's the best way to find love online without giving up all of your privacy? In this video, I hope to give you some ideas. This month, you can show the new oil a little bit of love by supporting us financially. We get a significant amount of our income from community support, and you can help us keep it that way. There's a variety of ways to support us, from fiat currencies like Open Collective and LibrePay, to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Monero, and we even have affiliate links where you buy a service or a product and we get a small kickback. There's also a merch store where you can go ahead and pick up some shirts, some coffee mugs, all kinds of things, and help support us and represent us in the real world. Maybe something you can wear on your first date. Either way, if you get help from these videos, it would really mean a lot to us if you could help support us in any way possible. As always, there are non-monetary ways of supporting us like liking, commenting, subscribing, and the whole nine. So regardless of what you are able to do and what you choose to do, we appreciate your help. Thank you so much for keeping us going. So before we talk about online dating, let's go ahead and give a nod to the old school way of dating, which is to start offline. Now, any of you who know me and have been watching any of my videos know for a while that I like technology. I am certainly not the first person who's going to be lining up to decry all the bad things that smartphones have done to this generation. I don't believe in that crap. I think technology is great. It just has some drawbacks we need to be aware of. That said, I think there's a lot of benefits to having an offline life in which to try and find someone to date. For example, start off by getting some hobbies. This isn't just privacy related or dating related. Everyone should have a variety of interests. This is good for you as a person and your mental health. It helps you grow and have an actual personality. I talk about privacy a lot. It is definitely what I'm well known for, not just on the internet, but in real life. But I'm also really into true crime. I'm really into science fiction. I play video games. I play music. I listen to music. I go to concerts. It also makes me a good conversationalist. I'm not a car guy, but I know a little bit about cars and I've talked to other car people and I have stories from them I can share. Not as me, for the record. I don't pretend to be that person and be like, well, one time this thing happened. I tell them I knew somebody who was in this situation that's interesting and relevant to this conversation. Like I said, this not only makes you a more interesting person and a better conversationalist, but it also gives you more opportunities to meet people. Like I said, I can go to concerts. I can go to science fiction conventions. I can go to science fiction movies. You could go to photography groups, book clubs. You could take cooking classes. There are all kinds of ways to turn your interests into a physical activity that you can go out and connect with other people who are like-minded. And in case you guys didn't know, having similar interests is a great start to a relationship. Obviously, you guys don't have to be carbon copies of each other. My wife and I certainly are not, but it helps a lot to have some things in common. If you're more of an introvert or you do activities that can be done solo, like photography or hiking, and you're having a hard time finding other people, there are meetup groups that are really helpful. Meetup.com is a really popular resource for this. And a lot of the time you don't have to actually have an account. You can just jump on the website, see what's going on in your area and decide to attend. If there are no meetups for a particular interest and you live in a sufficiently sized city, it may be a good idea to go start your own. It's as simple as finding an appropriate venue. For example, you may not want to hold an AA group at a bar and putting out the word on the proper channels where other people like you are likely to congregate. Going back to the fact that some hobbies are solo, you can still do these hobbies by yourself. You can go hiking, you can take photos, you can skateboard. Getting out of the house still increases your odds of meeting other people. Now, just a quick note on this. Remember not to go anywhere expecting to meet someone. You give off really weird vibes and you just end up really disappointed when you don't. 
This is especially true if you're gonna start your own group like I mentioned a second ago. You're gonna like really put out weird vibes, people are not gonna come back, the group is not gonna grow. The only other people you're gonna be stuck with as regulars are weirdos. Go into it with the intention of connecting and building community, either for yourself or for the group if you are the leader. If you're a cool person who is sufficiently interesting and well-rounded, then people will naturally flock to you. Some of those might turn into dates, some of them might not. That's totally fine, you just need to be accepting of that. Eventually you'll find someone, or eventually someone will meet you and be like, hey, I want to introduce you to my sister, brother, friend, whatever that I think you would really hit it off with. If you want something that is specifically more oriented toward dating, where you can be a little bit more open about the fact that you're here to meet somebody, then there's always things like speed dating or singles oriented groups. Although I'm gonna be honest, at that point, I feel like you should just go with the online option because at least then you can filter through your messages without having to waste the gas money to get to the meetup. Maybe that's just me. I'm an introvert and I'm kind of lazy, so I like taking things the easy way. Personally, I like online dating. It allowed me to present the best version of myself for a good first impression, whether that was a good profile picture or being an interesting conversationalist. Personally, I don't think I'm the best looking guy out there, and so that was always a really good leg up for me. Okay, so if you decide that you still wanna do things online, or maybe both, maybe you're gonna try meeting people in reality, but also have some dating profiles, then you will have to start by picking a service. There's a lot of things that go into picking a service. On the obvious privacy side, I've talked about things like privacy policies and how to read them. There's also the fact of if they require an app. Apps typically require a lot more permissions and are harder to keep private as opposed to a browser website. It's not saying you can't use them, it's just something to keep in mind. That said, there's also features. For example, Bumble has a paid feature where you won't show up in someone else's feed until you've already swiped right on them. So they won't see you until you've said that you're interested in them, at which point you will show up in their feed. Most dating apps also allow you to set your location if you pay for the premium service, which means that if you travel a lot, you can still show up in your hometown and people won't necessarily know you're traveling or be able to determine your schedule. On a non-privacy perspective, there's also demographic and target audience considerations. For example, Tinder is generally considered to be more of a hookup app. You might find a long-term relationship there, but it's generally the exception instead of the norm. And if that's where you're at in your life right now, where you're just looking for hookups, then hey, more power to you. But if you're looking for something a little more long-term, that might not be the right platform for you. You might wanna try out something more like eHarmony or Match. Once you've picked a service, remember to start off with the basic good privacy services, which I have talked about in other videos, using a solid password, using an alias email address, and enabling two-factor authentication in the settings, which I will talk about a little bit more in a minute. While you're in the settings enabling two-factor, be sure to poke around and look for other settings. For example, you can turn off personalized ads, you can restrict who can see your profile, you can disable some of the telemetry or crash reporting, things like that. If you do decide to go with a premium service, remember to use privacy.com or a similar masking option in case of a data breach. So now let's talk about filling out your profile. If the service requires a username, I would just go ahead and randomly generate one. I've talked about this before. You can use the passphrase generator in your password manager, or if you use Bitwarden, they have an actual username generator. Just, you know, make sure it's nothing too weird that might turn people away. If they require a real name, I recommend using a shortened version or a nickname. For example, if your name is Alexander, maybe use Alex or Go by your middle name instead of your first name. Nicknames are okay here as long as they are nicknames that you actually use. Don't put something there if people don't actually call you that because that's kind of weird. And for the record, same thing with the name. Don't lie too much. Eventually, you're going to have to come clean to this person. And if you've been laying down a pattern of lying, that's a huge red flag. You're not trying to lie here. You're just trying to defend yourself against data breaches and OSINT, which is open source intelligence or basically Googling somebody. You wanna protect a little bit of privacy, not lie to your partner. So don't lie, use short names, use nicknames, things like that. This is especially true when it comes to filling out your bio. I'm gonna be honest, back when I was dating, if somebody didn't fill out the bio, I just swiped left or just ignored them because you're not giving me anything to start with. There's literally nothing to make a conversation here. You should fill out your bio, but again, you have to make sure that you're careful what you're putting in there. For example, don't post in your bio that you have a four years bachelor's of science degree from UCLA. Just say, I have a four year degree in biology or something like that, or science. You can be as vague as you want, but gives people something to go on. For most people, it is totally safe to share general interests. Again, for me, true crime, cybersecurity, music. This is also a good place to start laying the groundwork for your interest in privacy. In the past, I have had good success by saying cybersecurity instead of privacy. A lot of people already know what cybersecurity is, and that actually intrigues them. I've had people comment that they didn't know you could do cybersecurity for a hobby. They thought it was like a career thing. 
When you say you're interested in privacy, it's kind of weird. People don't really know what that means. They don't know what it means to be into privacy. They think that you're trying to hide something. When you say that you're just interested in cybersecurity, it sounds just kind of like you're interested in tech. It comes off a lot less weird. Most people don't really know the difference anyways. And as you talk, you'll be able to explain, yeah, I'm really into things like using good passwords, encrypting my devices, setting up my own home servers, using encrypted messaging, whatever the case may be. For the profile picture, I personally prefer a profile picture. Maybe this is shallow, but I am of the belief that there has to be some degree of physical attraction for a romantic or sexual relationship to work. What you consider attractive and how much attraction you need obviously varies from person to person, but generally speaking, most people would not enter a long-term relationship with someone they're just not attracted to. Sorry if that sounds harsh, but in my experience, I have yet to hear anyone disagree. Therefore, I think you should put up a photo of yourself. But there are, of course, some guidelines. Number one, make sure it's a unique photo. A lot of image search engines claim that they don't use facial recognition to search for you, but they will use the photo itself. So if you just crop a photo or even worse, just reuse a photo, they will be able to match that. But if you take a totally unique photo, only an actual facial recognition search engine will find that, which these days admittedly may be an issue, but we're kind of working with what we got here. The big thing is to be sure to leave out any identifying marks. Don't wear your work shirt, don't have the downtown skyline in the background, don't have your mail out on the counter, stuff like that. If you're posting a group photo out with some friends, be sure to black out their faces in some sort of paint software like GIMP. You don't want people confusing you for someone else anyways. It would be horrible to show up on the first date and be like, oh my God, I thought you were the other person in the photo. Probably not a great way to start. Once you begin using the service, remember that your messages are not private. They are visible to at least some employees, if not all of them, and they are visible to the person you are sending them to. You never know if they're gonna screenshot them, print them out, post them on the internet. You don't know. There's whole subreddits dedicated to making fun of bad Tinder conversations. Your stuff might end up there. Now, just to round things out, let me talk about some basic safety tips when you're meeting up in person with someone for a first date. The two most common tips I've heard are to, number one, meet somewhere public. This could be, again, a bar, a library, a restaurant, whatever. And number two, tell someone close to you where you're going and when you expect to be back. Basically, give them all the information in case you went missing. Make sure you trust this person not to take advantage of that information. And if you're not back at the time you plan to be back, be sure to let them know that. For example, say like, hey, the date's supposed to end at 10, but if things are going really well and you think you want to go over for coffee, be sure to get in touch with your friend and be like, hey, I'm cool. We're going to go back to their place for coffee. Here's the address. I'll text you in the morning, whatever the case may be. If you're really, really worried about this, I know there are apps out there that allow you to temporarily share your location to a trusted person. I've never personally used those. They're probably not great for the privacy policy. If you think you need to use one of those, by all means, your safety is far more important than some stupid app privacy policy. Go ahead and use one of those. But at the same time, if you've been talking to someone for quite a while, hopefully you'll pick up on any red flags and be able to avoid that if that's the situation. Remember to be safe. Last but not least, I just want to touch on the idea of coming out, which is telling the person that you're really into privacy and that you may have been lying. Except that if you follow these tips, you're not lying. The worst thing you've been doing is using a middle name or withholding information. And the more you get to know a person and the more they understand that you're really into privacy and this kind of stuff, they're not really gonna be bothered by that. They're not gonna feel betrayed. They're gonna understand that you've just been playing your cards close to your chest. The fact is getting into a long-term committed relationship with anyone, whether that's a close friendship or a romantic partnership, means that you're going to have to open up a little bit. You don't necessarily have to tell somebody your real name, date of birth, and social on the first date, but the more you get to know this person, you have to accept that they're gonna learn these things about you eventually. They're gonna know when your birthday is. They're gonna know the things you like. They're gonna know where you work. They're gonna know what you do. That's okay. Privacy isn't about keeping everyone out all the time. It's about controlling who knows what. As you grow in your relationship with this person and get to know them better, you will know what information you can share with them and what you can't. And if this turns into something long-term and serious, then you need to ask yourself what you're comfortable sharing. And hopefully, if this is a good, healthy relationship, the answer is almost everything. There is a lot that goes into building a healthy relationship. I really recommend you check out resources on building good communication. There's a lot of them out there. Communication really is the foundation of any relationship, whether it's romantic, work, platonic, whatever. Become a good communicator and recognize how to manage your emotions when you're feeling emotional, and that'll honestly get you like 80 to 90% of the way there. A couple of tips from my personal experience. Personally, I found on first dates, I like to go for the big questions. 
Things like, do you want to have kids? Do you want to move out of town at some point? Stuff like that. I like to know right up front if there's a deal breaker. You may still choose to continue the relationship on a less serious basis if that's your kind of thing, but I would like to know up front before I get super emotionally invested and then it turns out we're not on the same page. I've also personally had a lot of success by doing monthly check-ins. I know this sounds like really unromantic, but if you schedule a recurring time once a month, maybe like the first Sunday of each month, every afternoon, we're gonna sit down and check in. How are things going? Is there anything happened in the last month that you're upset about that you wanna work out and talk through? Is there any big plan coming up that you wanna work towards? Things like that. It really helps to tackle things before they become bottled up and festered inside and become this huge fight down the road but it does require you to be mature and admit that you are not perfect and that maybe you screw things up sometimes and have to be willing to actually change your behavior. That's all I've got for you. Relationships are complicated. There's a reason there's so many books about them, some of them better than others, but that's really what it comes down to. Remember not to lie to anyone. Take steps on the back end in your account security to protect your account and obscure your real information, but also take steps on the front end to make sure that you're not broadcasting everything to everybody. And again, don't lie. Privacy, again, you're not trying to be anonymous to this person. You're trying to slowly vet who does and doesn't deserve to know things about you. Some people will, and that's okay. You don't have to be anonymous from everyone, but some people won't. Some people you'll go on a first date and be like, thank God I didn't give that crazy person my real phone number. You're probably gonna have to slog through a lot of crappy dates before you find good ones, and that really sucks, but that's not a privacy thing, that's just the dating game. That said, if you are the kind of person who's looking for a relationship, I think you can find it. I believe in you. The numbers are in your favor. You just have to be smart and careful about how you go about this. If you found this video helpful, please support us if you're able to. Again, we have a merch store where you can get things like coffee cups, t-shirts, and stickers. We also accept fiat currency donations, one-time and recurring. We also accept cryptocurrency donations. And of course, we have affiliate links where you can buy something to help protect your privacy, and we get a little bit in return. And of course, you can support us without spending a dime by sharing the video around, subscribing, and liking and leaving a comment. That really helps, especially on those algorithmic sites like YouTube, really helps people to discover us. If you think there's anything I missed, by all means, please leave it in the comments. Dating is, again, very complex, very complicated, and in today's world, it's changing fast. There's always new apps and new things to be concerned about. So if you have any tips that I missed, go ahead and let your fellow viewers know in the comments. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.